Thank you. Hi, Austin. Hi. Woo! I know it's 11 a.m. For me, it's really late in Paris. I went to bed at 8 yesterday. Not really happy. Um, hi, Austin. How are you? Good? Cool. Um, are you ready for awesome talks on disruptive technologies? Yes. yes. You're ready for that? Are you ready for parties? Good. Are you ready um, for me maybe saying things that could get me banned from this country? Yeah. Yes! <laughs> Hell yes! <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to try to not swear, but you know it's in me, I'm French. <laughs> All right, let's go. Um, have a presentation. I did my homework, basically. Here's my message today. Um, I'm really glad that so many of you came this morning to talk about a topic that's political, uh, that's seriously dividing a lot of us at the moment. But nevertheless, that's a topic that concerns all of us. And especially directly 65 million people on this planet. I'm talking about refugees or displaced people also, as you know the technical term. And my intentions the, for this keynote is to share with you the stories and the facts that I hope will inspire you to think of migration and refugee differently and inspire you so that it empowers you and empowers all of us to think that there is, we have the solutions for a healthier debate on migration. But quickly, I really want to say what I am not going to be talking about. Because I think there's been a lot of polarizing speech on this topic. And so I want to clear it out for you. I am not here to make an advocacy for open borders, freedom of movement, and let's be happy all together. I am not doing this. I am not also saying that there are the people that are pro-migration, and they're good people, and they're just a bunch of racists on the other side. And I am not also saying, by saying it's not a refugee crisis, it's a crisis of hospitality, the fact that it's not about refugees, it's about us. I'm not saying that there's not actual suffering of refugees. There is. I've seen it from my own eyes. And what makes me say this is actually what I've been living for the past 30 years, back where I'm from. Um, what I'd like to say about today is, can we have, and we can, have a healthier debate to build bridges so we can build stronger foundation to our democracies? And what makes me say this is where I'm from. So I don't know how many of you, I, I'm from France in the north of France, nearby Normandy a few kilometers away from Calais. Um, let's do a bit of geography here. So you probably know Saint-Tropez. It's full of rich tourists. It's sunny. Well, think of the complete opposite, and that's where I'm from. Gray, <laughs> poor, um, and lots of undocumented migrants trying to cross the channel, we call it, to get to the UK. Let's get deeper in geography here. Calais is 33 kilometers away from the UK. So let's just say that I can see the UK from my house. <laughs> um, and it's also 177 kilometers from London. And growing up there, I've always seen migrants, undocumented migrants. The only change that I've had to experience throughout time has been where they're from. In the 90s, they were from ex-USSR Yugoslavia. In the beginning of 21st century, they're coming from Afghanistan, from Iraq. And nowadays, they're coming from Syria. But the migrants have always been here. They tell you there's a crisis. There's been a crisis for a long time. The only thing that I've seen shockingly happening is a degrading condition for them. And that's a bit the story I want to tell you. When I was five, 
I'd cross that channel, would go to the UK, just a simple border check with my passport. I'd see some guys running around, trying to get in the lorry, hide there, expecting to go to the UK illegally. Some died. At 10, the Europe uh, decided to remove borders internally. It was called the Schengen area, and then have external borders only. That meant for me, could go on vacation in Spain, Italy, Germany, without the need for any border checks, border control. I would not experience, at the age of 10 anymore, any border within Europe. In contrast, in Calais, more police was brought in because the UK did decide not to be part of that area, Schengen area, and so more police was brought in and more arrests were made. At 12, I, thanks to an awesome dad, I was uh, surfing the internet. He brought the internet at home. I could connect to people all over the world. I would speak with people in uh, Algeria, US, um, Australia, and I would spend a lot of time trying to practice my English through that. It gave me a real um, connection with the world, with information, but also a feeling of wanting to travel and expand. In Calais, uh, well, things got worse. They destroyed the center that sheltered the migrants. So the migrants were asked to be outside, laying on the ground, sleep at night on the streets. They were more visible, and the city was getting grimmer. At 18, thanks to hours spent on Messenger, MSN Messenger speaking in English, and hours spent on Wikipedia, uh, learning about the principle of economics and principle of politics, I got into uh, what you would call in France elite school. Um, probably the equivalent here in the US would be the Kennedy School. Um, and was able to just meet people from all over the world, international students in Paris. Thanks to that school, I was going on a third year abroad in New York. They arranged my visa, arranged my placement. Um, and thanks to a partnership that the school had with the UK and also being European, I could go get my master's at the London School of Economics without the need for a visa and actually paying the same fees that any local would pay not as an international student because I was a European. The point I'm trying to make here is that I was able to enjoy so much of this world because of one important factor. That's my passport. That's where I'm from, that's where I'm born. Nobody chooses where they're born. And yet, I was able to enjoy that on the fact that I didn't choose. Here is a chart of where you can go with your passport. If you're from Germany, you can go to 174 countries in the world without the need for a visa. You don't have to apply. Here, um, you probably now have seen it. Most of you will be able to travel the world without the need for a visa to 174 countries. I can get one less than you. I wonder which one. We pissed off at uh, with the French Macron or someone. Uh, and at the bottom of the list, you get Afghanistan. If you're born in Afghanistan, you can travel to the world to 24 countries. Those countries, I heard there's a term now to, to describe countries that are not really cool. It involves poop or something. Won't say it. Um, but, so basically if you're born from Afghanistan, the world is summarized in 24 countries. Try to get a visa for the other countries, they'll try to tell you that you're actually looking to get a tourist visa to actually um, illegally stay. That's most of the time what happens. And I've made a bit of a Google search on kayak. From Afghanistan, you can't have a direct flight from Kabul. You can't have a direct flight to those 24 countries, so let's better say the, the world is summarized to Afghanistan for you. Awesome. And that's that one, one thing that really, 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 when I discovered this, really, really profoundly made me feel the world is really unfair and, and it's hypocritical to say that we are in a modern world telling people you can be what you want. You are 
you, you should look and strive to have a better life and to, to expand and to be happy every day when actually where you're born is, is where you'll die, basically. Um, so I started a, a company in uh, the UK called Migrate and we try to make migration information available for everyone in their language and personalized. And that was my way to revolt. I was also really, really um, enthusiastic, excited about technology. It was the time that Uber and Airbnb was starting. It was 2012. And so I thought maybe I can help so many people that were not born in the right country get those legal visas and then improve their lives so that justice will be made. But every time yet I would come back to Calais, it was really grim. And the reality hit me and the absurdity of the reality was the most striking. In 2015, the UK government gave us in France 2.3 million to build a wall in France, in Calais. Here's the building. Um, to give you a perspective of what that means, that number, 2.3 million pounds is the sum you could get to put a camp hosting 2,500 refugees in Calais, a modern one with hygiene conditions. It's also the same um, amount that you would take to get 300 refugees in the UK for a year. That would be the same price. That's absurd. That's absurd that the money spent is not spent on helping people, it's spent on removing them from, from, from where they're trying to go. Uh, but anyway, um, just to put in context, I said to you, Kelly's poor. Kelly is pretty poor. Unemployment pockets are really heavy there, and it's been 10 years, 20 years now. 2.3 million to put a wall in Calais was an insult to local citizens of not fostering local economic development or helping them find employment almost. Anyway. But again, I took that picture because you see there's a bit of a door. Maybe they were just not really sure what they were doing, right? So I keep it there. I don't want to give them like the blame, the full blame on it. Um, the second thing that was absurd is conditions were getting worse. Built, the, the wall was built, less people were going through, and so more people were stuck. And as more people got stuck, conditions were getting worse. Local charities went to sue the state, the French government, for not providing water fountains and toilets in the city for those migrants that were outside. They were punished. The, the court said that the charities were right and the government had to pay and put water fountains and toilets. You know what the French government did? They appealed. They appealed on the claim that if you put fountains and toilets, it's going to bring more migrants. I mean, I didn't know people were getting excited so much by toilets that they would come from Nigeria to Afghanistan to just enjoy those toilets, really. You know? So just I'm making it reinforcing the contrast, but this is, this is a bit weird. And I don't know what's the trend with walls. Is it because there's a graffiti artist contest? Uh, but we now have more walls than we've ever had. It's been building, building over the years. We have more than 70. Uh, at the end, when the Berlin Wall fell, there was probably a dozen only. So a wall is what? A wall is made to prevent invasion. So maybe there's an invasion, maybe they, they're right to put a wall. Uh, the thing is, the number of immigrants that came, undocumented migrants, that came to Europe in 2015 is 1.5 million. Compare that to the population of Europe, it's 0.15%. When you know that in Lebanon, 30% of the population is made of refugees, you wanna just Take a bit of perspective on the invasion here. And, and here you have the graph. It's like most countries that are actually taking on the refugees are not in Europe, Sweden a little bit, because it has a lot of people coming, uh, bring, trying to uh, get reunited to their families. But most of them are at the border of where the crisis is. And that's a normal fact. 
Refugees are people that are forced to migrate. They never wanted to leave home. And so they prefer to stay close to where they are. Because when the war is over, when the problem is over, they want to go back. So that makes sense. It's not an invasion. So if it's not an invasion, what is it? Yeah, there were 1.5 million, it's a lot. It's two times the number of refugees we got uh, back in the 90s because of ex-Yugoslavia disappearing. So okay, let's, let's say that it's a lot. But the problem is, historically, we had this. We had this and Europe was very proud to say, we welcome refugees. It was an honor. It was an honor and we welcomed the Russians that were fleeing away from communism in the 1920s. It was, there was no easy jet or like really uh, easy flights, but 420,000 Russians came in Europe. Half a million, half a million Spaniards crossed the Pyrenees, the south border of France, in two weeks after Franco took over in Spain, the, the dictator. And we dealt with it. We were really proud. And some arrived in Calais, actually. And the mayor of Calais said, please give blankets. It's our honor to shelter them from dictatorship in Spain. So it was an honor. If it's not facts, if it's not history that tells us why we're building walls, what is it? I'll give you a hint at it. In 2015, David Cameron, the UK Prime Minister, talked about the migrants in Calais as a swarm of migrants that he was determined to keep away from the UK. Katie Hopkins, a public British influencer, talked about migrants in Calais as cockroaches. Cockroaches. And and then followed the media that said that Kelly was a jungle. I didn't know I had a jungle. If I had known, I, I'd have taken a ticket to go to the zoo, but uh, they described my city as a jungle where animals were living. And then finally, this dude, ah, uh, no, that's not the right slide. Can we go back? Oops. Ah, that's the Spaniards that crossed the, that guy. Nigel Farage said we're at breaking point, obviously, and talked about hordes of criminals coming to the UK, hence why we need to break with the EU. So here you have the physical borders, physical walls we're building are reflecting this insidious words and thoughts that are being put out there. And these are the walls within our minds. The walls that are dehumanizing. It's, it's a concept, actually. Dehumanizing is a concept and it's a process. It's a process by which you say, there's us and there's them. It's a polarizing rhetoric to create an enemy. And it's been recorded throughout history that every genocide was linked to that. We're fighting human biology here. Uh, we are hot-wired, heart-wired to associate what we see with reality, obviously, to believe in what we see, and to put meaning into words that are put out there. And cockroaches was not the first time it was used. It was used by the Hutus in Rwanda to start the genocide against the Tutsis. The Tutsis were cockroaches and we know what happened in Rwanda. And so, hardwired like this, we're super vulnerable to anyone who would put out there words and images that will make us think it's real. And it always starts with words, then images. So if we're so vulnerable to words and images, we definitely need to try to take that power of words and images and invert it to create positive narratives, to create something that's against the one with Nigel Farage. And right now, without transition, I'm going to put a photo that's taken all over Europe in 2015 that changed the whole mood. Compared to that, 
the one you have here. Here was the consequence of those words of we don't want them here. That's a violent picture. That's the one picture that took over all media in Europe and drove Europeans to go in train station the day after to say welcome to refugees. That picture moved the whole Europe. And for a month, people were just all pro-immigration, just for a month, because they had to fight this. People that were ready to reiterate that rhetoric and then went on to use fake images and fake words to say, no, 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 they are actually coming to, to take you over. But anyway, so that picture was the start of what you heard um, earlier and, and my organization, which is Tech Refugees. And this, I was not founding it. It's Mike Butcher, the editor of TechCrunch, a big influence in the tech industry in Europe, who, when he saw that picture, called on a post on Facebook and said, guys, if we're going to fight this, it's not about posting pictures on Facebook and saying we're sorry. It's about pragmatic action. So what can we do beyond donations? What can we do beyond donations that will empower those people that are trying to cross the sea? It was maybe a naive question, but it took that like white fire. He created a group, and then it went wild. I joined the first day, and here I saw. 300 people joined 10 days later. CEOs of tech companies, refugees, NGOs came to discuss what technology could do to help those people. Hassan Akkad from Damas in Syria told us that he was on his phone on WhatsApp when his boat was sinking and pinpoint where he was to the Coast Guard and he was saved. 60 people were saved. We heard from Refunite on that day that they're using mobile tech and, and mobiles to reunite families and loved ones so they can find back each other. That wouldn't have been able, able to, without the smartphones or phones. And we also heard from awesome geeks in Greece that had started putting up a spreadsheet with a collection system with hygiene products, food, and water. And then they had a WhatsApp group where they could call the truck drivers and tell them what had arrived, where, and where to ship it. And it was people from Texas to Philippines to Africa that were providing instant connection to these truck drivers via WhatsApp onto seeing the log on Excel sheets. Didn't need much technology. Needed to use what was out there. So there was a sense, there was momentum on that day. There was a sense we could at least maybe alleviate some of the pain here. And so TechFugees was started. And it grew, like it became a, a, an internet meme, and, and it grew out of proportion. People came calling from Oslo to New York, to Krakow, to Australia, to Paris, saying we want to do the same. We want to do a hackathon where we're going to create technology for the refugees. So we did. We provided guidelines on how to create a hackathon. We provided listing of what technology to use or what was out there, what were the projects. Um, to give you a bit of a few ones, uh, because I like to be concrete about what happened. Those guys in Serbia, they created a mobile Wi-Fi router that you can put on your backpack and have internet liaison at any time uh, if you're crossing countries or if you want to stay in touch with your uh, family and get information about where the border is closing. We got blockchain used in um, Lebanon by EdTech to provide cash to the refugees. So you'd have a tracking of where the money is spent and on what. And across Iraq, Jordan, Turkey, uh, Germany, you name it. It was Ali, Yug, uh, Anne, Mozamel, a refugee himself, creating refugee boot camps, coding boot camps, uh, coding schools for the refugees to find back skills and get into the local tech community. Ah, there's another project I'd like to tell you about. There's this project that started in Lebanon. It was a girl from New York. She went with a Skype connection to link the refugees in camps with people that wanted to learn Arabic so that the refugees within camps could provide those lessons through Skypes and be paid for that. That was what was happening. We failed big time. 
Like, I will not <laughs> put this away. We felt big time and we learned a lot during those hackathons. We learned that you have to go on the ground to get really a sense of what are the real problems of the refugees. And I left my house and for two years I was a nomad, didn't have a house, was always on the ground. We learned that you have to co-create. We learned that you don't do the, 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 the product for refugees thinking of what is a refugee, you do it with him and not such as just feedback, get them ownership of the product. And lastly, we heard keep it simple, keep it with a hacking attitude because the conditions on the ground are not that easy. If you don't put an app, they're gonna have to download it. They're gonna have to remember that password on their Apple store if they have an iPhone. If it's not, it's not an Android. Now, just keep it simple and put it on WhatsApp maybe out there. Uh, and if you're doing anything, just make sure that it doesn't use a lot of battery because they might lack of battery. So, we learned a lot, and basically today, TechFugees is 25 chapters across the world, 18,000 people that have been involved through hackathons and innovative projects. We empower the displaced with technology, and we're based on the facts, on two, two facts are building our vision. Is first, we've seen the refugees, they're connected. They are on their phones, they're on Facebook. They have that in their hands. And the second thing is technology, because it scales and cross borders, is up to the size of the challenge. I told you it's 65 million people. But enough about tech refugees. I mean, what I'm most proud of is that the community took over. It's, we, we, we were here to support the community and the community took over. Here's a hackathon we hosted in Paris for the Olympic Games, preparing for the Olympic Games, where the refugees pitched a, just using all the apps to do sport to create a body program for refugees to get involved and do football, yoga, jogging with other Parisians because they don't ever meet. And again and again, those refugees have told us something very precious. They've come to our event and then they say, I'm not a refugee, I'm a tech refugee. And the second thing is, it's the first time I'm accepted, I'm seen for what I am, not a hero, not a victim but a human being with skills. Um, and we've, so we've started to create a narrative, create images that are positive, that are showing that they're also human beings and they are part of our shared humanity, those people that have lost everything. And, and we need more, and we need you. And we need you for one important fact, is that if we don't build those bridges, we will not be able to continue with our democracies as the way we live them today. For a simple fact is that climate change is happening. And what you need to realize is it's counterintuitive, but most of the migration happening is forced by the environment, not by wars. Obviously it's counterintuitive because the war is visible. It displaces a lot of people in a short amount of time. But I can tell you, environmental factors are displacing three times more people than anywhere. It's happening right now. And we're gonna have more. We're gonna have more, and there's no better place here than Texas that has known the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. This is your, this is the biggest migration, this is the biggest displacement of Americans in your whole history. 3.5 million people have been displaced because of the Dust Bowl between 1930s and 19, the 1940. Um, you've seen the movie, the, the Grapes of, no, what is it? The Grapes of Rap, I can't say it, sorry. Um, great movie, um, but if you watch it again, just put the name instead of, the ma main actor could be Syrian, it would be the whole same thing. You've experienced this and your, your mayor knows it. He's, he's decided to get into the COP 2022 uh, with when your president backed out of the Paris Agreement. He said that he would be one of the cities that will be working against climate change because climate change and migration are one and the same threat. More climate change, more migration. 
and in the US it's going to be it's going to be Florida and, and uh, Louisiana, Louisiana? Yeah. Uh, who are going to be hit first. We need to keep that in mind that it's going to be climate refugees next. So I'm not also going to remind you where you're from. You know your own history. You're an inspiring nation of entrepreneurs. You were immigrants coming here, building an innovative country. And you have to plug into that DNA of yours because we have a situation here that I think we can all together work at to make the American dream still live again. And that is the situation. 65 million people, I told you, that are refugees today. We expect more. One out of two is under 18. The time spent in camp, 17 years on average. You're born, you die, you live there. Not everyone is in a camp. 80% of refugees are living outside of camps, actually. And more than 90% of them are in areas with 2 or 3G access. So we have an equation and opportunity here to do something and to connect with these other human beings. Just to finish, here is in Zat Arin, the refugee camp in Jordan. It's at the border of Syria. It is the largest refugee camp in Jordan. Uh, approximately 80,000 people. It's been there for a while. Those girls, when I asked them where they're from, they said, I'm from Zaatari, which is the camp they're from. They're from Syria, but they don't remember anything about Syria. And I don't know if they're gonna ever get out of the camp, who knows. But I know that the second question they asked me after, where are you from, me? and I told them Paris, they were like, can you take us on a trip? We've never been outside. I said, I can't promise, but I saw they had phones and I said, do you have Facebook? And I said, yeah. I said, let's connect on Facebook and I'll make sure that if I can't get you out, at least I'll get you out there in the world on this picture and maybe people can connect to you. So I'd like to do one thing. Please take your phone out. Take all your phones out. This is the most powerful tool you'll ever get today. This is something that is more powerful than a technology that put the man on the moon. And yet, you're not using it yet enough to its potential. So if there's one thing you can do today to feel less power powerless, you could probably just simply connect on Facebook Go on any refugee groups, take refugees if you want, uh, UNICEF, UNHCR. I'm not asking you about donating money, even though if you want, you can, you know, like, it's always open. <laughs> Door always open. <laughs> um, but, but join these groups and you have skills, they have skills. They want to talk. You want to talk? Just get on there. Give them Skype credits through what you can. Yeah, talk to them and ask them what they want to learn today, or if they want to learn coding, or if they want to learn a language. Talk to them, bring them back, and, and bring them back to our humanity, but bring your humanity back. And, and on that note, I'd like to introduce you to our movement, our community, so you get a better sense, because I'm a face, I'm a voice, but I want you to see the real people, the refugees, non-refugees, um, people that are making tech refugees today. Thank you very much. A few years ago, I brought together startups, technologists, and entrepreneurs, and humanitarians together to challenge each other and to try and come up with solutions for the issues around migration. That became tech refugees. So, this is tech refugees. Jordan here at Zinc, we proudly support innovation by refugees to refugees. I work for Refunite, Epic Refugees, 
search and reconnect with their families using mobile technology. TikTok is a platform that connects refugees with interpreters. I'm the founder of Startup Without Borders, a platform that connects refugee and migrant entrepreneurs with resources to start their businesses. I'm one of the co-founders of Speak, that connects migrants, refugees and locals living in the same city. We're helping not only the people, we help Cisco, the company and the whole of Germany. We are a coding school for newcomers to Germany or newcomers to tech. Hello. I am volunteering with TechUGs to design out the new base features platform. I'm developing software for TechUGs website and organizing hackathon. Uh, we connect language learners around the world with TechUGs uh, for language practice over Skype. This is your founder of Wispy, the one-stop shop venue booking platform that is disrupting the world of booking conferences, meetings and events. Hello from Paris, where the Tech Fugees community has been growing for two years now. We are over 1,000 people in France organizing events, fellowships, hackathons, meetups. We are Tech Fugees. A journalist should be here. Ah, here. <laughs> Didn't say anything. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. clears throat> So I wanted to start uh, with just a couple of numbers. Um, in the US, uh, since 1980, uh, we've, there have been about 3 million refugees who have been resettled in the US, uh, which may sound like a large number of people. Uh, but by comparison, um, right now, uh, in Turkey alone, there are almost 3 million Syrian refugees currently. Um, so. I think in the U.S., our, our, the, the political consciousness of refugees tends to be lower. It's just less of a, you know, a problem that we encounter day to day. Mm -hmm. And I think in the American sort of political consciousness, when we think of refugees, we think of like the photos that you showed, um, you know, the small child in a war-torn country covered in rubble. So, you know, I, I, I don't think the conception is of this like tech-savvy, super tech guru kind of person. Um, so, Josephine, I'm curious, why, why you go through the technological route to empower these people? What, what role, um, you know, how can technology really help? Cool. Um, I think there's, there's two big reasons here. Um, first, we have a tech industry that says we disrupt the lives of people. And they do, but not everyone. So, um, if we're going to be true to our words, we're going to disrupt the lives of people that are in the most need of disruption, I think. And we can, it's technically, uh, technically we can. It's not a technical issue, as we know, it's a political issue here. So we could put um, Wi-Fi in camps, we don't. Um, and it's a political decision. So we don't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's first, <clears throat> technically, we can. Um, again, technology is at scale. So once you nail it somewhere, we can replicate at low cost somewhere else. It doesn't mean that we're gonna not iterate and make it, you know, like you have to really understand also the context in which you're putting your technology. Not let's not try to scale things and break things because you can't do break things or you have people die. But you can scale across borders those services, and we've seen many, many times there's refugees all using their phones to perform all of what they need, and I've seen number of times the refugees telling me like no i didn't go to their charity i just got in online i was like ah, it's gonna be tough <laughs> for the refugees so would you say the majority of refugees that you're working with they already they already have a smartphone or what is sort of their right. technological okay. access point there is the impression that refugees are poor dirty people that are just no it's not like the case um most refugees that arrive in europe 90%, 99% for Syrians, it depends on the nationality, right? Had a phone. 
analog smartphone, the, the, the kind of phone, iPhone and stuff, was really depending on more of their cultural, where they're from, than, than their money, at least. Um, so they had. Um, and yeah, and, and that's it. You get to the fact. Now, they don't use the phones like we do. They don't use it as a, uh, as a sort of uh, productivity tool that we might use to help our daily lives, right? They use it very much to communicate with their families and to communicate. They'll go on WhatsApp and Facebook all the time. But still, they do have access to that technology and that's the best way to connect with them. And from the word of uh, Hassan that I talked about earlier, he was like, you know, I, I was with my phone. I was told first I have to apply to the refugee asylum system via Skype here in Greece. So I couldn't do it like offline. <laughs> so in Greece, they know that they have, we have phones. And secondly, he was like, I could go to a charity that get my fingertips, I'll be put in a camp and I'll stay there in limbo for maybe 17 years. I don't know. And then I could connect on this Facebook group with other Syrians that told me this smuggler there, this is 4,000 euros, but the smuggler, Mar his name was Marco from the Serbian mafia, will get me to the UK. And so he paid the 4,000, yeah, he paid, yeah. And, and then he went to the UK and now he's a um, awarded filmmaker who's um, filmed his own journey on GoPro as a Syrian refugee. And he's saying, I, I've spent all my money into technology and smugglers helping me in Europe, not putting money into the European Union and it, its people. So, so if most people are arriving, they have, they have the, a smartphone or some mm -hmm. other sort of technological access point. What then is the biggest need? What, you know, you know, across the board, what kind of services are they lacking? Information, information, information. They want information about where they find, can find services, where they can be helped. They, don't, they need information about where to navigate. And then after information, once they get it, it's really about how do I get back into education and university for training, or how do I get back into employment? That's like any human being. Once you've been displaced and you had to flee away to escape from death, because that's the definition of a refugee. A refugee compared to other migrants is forced to flee when he didn't want because he is threatened of death. And if you want to be recognized as a refugee, because you're not a refugee until you're validated to be a refugee, you have to prove two things. That you are threatened of death for um, religious, race, political, you name it, reasons first you have to prove it so if you were raped you have to prove it and the second thing is you have to prove that your government was not capable or didn't want keep you safe where you were this is why there's a notion also of internally displaced someone in Mosul that is going um, in Europe will be often told well you're from Mosul you could have gone to Baghdad because Baghdad is safe. And we are right now returning Afghanis to Kabul because we know Kabul is a great place to go on vacation. So, uh, so this is a note I make so you understand. And so refugees are in need to get back with their lives. They have lost their house, they've lost their car, they have lost their degrees because their degrees have no value in Europe. Uh, for, for, yeah, we've started, I, I'll tell you, we started, <laughs> We, the, the, the worst thing is for the woman, actually. Um, we started a fellowship for refugee women in Paris that we're piloting and we'll put at large scale in Europe. The 12 women that are in the group, they are doctors, engineers, um, doctors, engineers, lawyers, uh, yeah, that's most of their jobs back in the days. And right now they are cashiers at the corner shop for the past two years, three years in France. So there's like this talent that is waiting to be recognized as talent. So all they need is information, um, recognition, recognition of their skills, and then employment like any human being. It sounds to me like those are big issues, right? Things that, you know, education, for example, might be able to sort of cultivate talent, you know, big questions that obviously the technology sector can sort of play. And it has solved. And 
right now, the technology sector has created those MOOCs, right? We've enjoyed learning online. Right now, we're putting MOOCs online in Syria for the Syrian displaced, still in Syria. They don't want to go out. It's too dangerous. What will they do? Can they bring their uh, families with them? Well, the travel will make them like too dangerous. So we're teaching them English so they can have access to the English uh, world online. And that's like super important. It got me to a good school because I could go on Memes and Messenger, yeah, thanks to my English skills. So we're trying to reproduce that. And for charities that are on the ground, they were like, why do you do that? Why do you provide them with online classes? And why don't we have a teacher? We told them like, we might want to have them connect with the world. I wanted to bring today my phone and just like do a Skype directly to Syria and to the people we, we help there, but it's too dangerous, right? So, but that's possible. It's technically possible. Um, these are also, I think, large questions that not only the technology sector is no. grappling with, right, but governments. And, and, and I think, um, you know, TechFugees describes itself as a, um, as a politically independent organization um, but I wonder, you know, in 2018, in an era when, you know, just yesterday, President Donald Trump appointed a, a complete immigration hardliner to, the, to head the refugee program at the State Department. Um, here in Texas, the state just two years ago completely withdrew from the refugee resettlement program, basically saying that Syrian refugees were too great of a security risk. Um, given the you know current political climate, is it really possible for a tech group like yours to remain apolitical? So we are apolitical in the sense that we're not affiliated to any party. When President Macron was elected, I got a lot of calls to just like rally around Macron and stuff, and I was like, guys, I, I'm, we're not we're not supporting any party. We're supporting. Uh, postula, uh, posting a line, which is refugees. We're all in it together because of climate change happening especially. So we're going to all bring them back. It's not about the refugees are good, the refugees are bad. We're against that rhetoric. And that's our, that's our line politically. It's like no human beings is worth more or less. We're all worth the same thing. And we need to especially have a policy of welcoming and give them shelter because they are a threat of death, right? It's for refugees, it's not about the whole migration. So we will keep on that hard line of, you need to welcome human beings that have been threatened uh, and not uh, follow any party line. Yeah. Um, we'd like to open it up to audience questions. Uh, just a reminder, you can submit questions here via slido.com. Um, our first question here is um, from the audience. What do you believe is the number one thing uh, that would be improved for everyone if there were no borders or visa restrictions? And, and what do you think is the number one risk? Okay, so I'll repeat one thing is I didn't advocate for that. Uh, <laughs> but I'd like it to be fair. So you, you remember my slide about the number of countries you can travel without a visa? If everybody had the same chance to be able to travel, that would be the first thing. Um, the one thing to improve everyone, I heard a study, I, I read a study, it was uh, five years ago, that the GDP would be augmented like really greatly if there was a no border policy for everyone in the world. Uh, I don't recall how much, but it would have, you'd have less inequalities around the world thanks to that. After that, it's economies doing it, so it's just a projection and you remove hypothesis and, so it's, it's, it's the concept, but that's the one thing that would happen if there were no border, if there would be more equality, I guess. The idea being that there is sort of untapped potential yeah. f within you, the refugee community to do this high-skilled labor, or, or what is, how, how do you sort of unlock that economic potential? Theoretically, you'd think that if you get a market without borders, then you get better allocation of resources, right? And people can go to where they're needed or where they want to go. Uh, and as we see, as a human species, we evolved where we wanted to go, where it was better. So we built cities where there was a lake or there was like resources and we moved as we went to survive and to thrive. So you would think that with a no border policy, you'd have a better allocation of people across the world. Um, I think, yeah, that's my answer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have another question here. Um, 
how can uh, how can just local communities get involved, or what is uh, you know for for us sort of non tech literate folks in the audience, um, what can your average Joe actually do about this? You can go online on TechFugees and then just say, hey, I know how to do this, or I want to connect to a refugee that needs my skill, and that does a lot. I can tell you for the number of refugees that they don't need your help, you know? It's, I mean, don't put that out of context, but when we did the fellowship with the women in Paris, they were very grateful. The mentors thought they were bringing something to those women, and they were like, yeah, we're bringing them, like, all of this. And at the end, what they realized is the refugees had more to bring them. Um, and, and the mentors were actually impressed by their background. So what you can do is simply connect with them and see, and, and as human beings, we help each other. Um, they don't need us, we need them, really. I think we need them because it's really about us. It's, it's about reconnecting. If, if, if you get a good immigration, and, and in some ways, the fact that we have a discussion on immigration today is symptomatic. It's symptomatic that some people feel their life standards of living has not improved in the last 10 to 20 years. Why would they think that a refugee who's lost everything, who comes here, his life will get better? This person that even maybe talk your language. I, we have to have empathy for someone who's scared of that. And we have to understand that they're afraid because it's, it is actually a mirror of society. It is a mirror that there's something broken into the way we distribute wealth and in the way we create an equal society. When you don't welcome the refugees because you're afraid they take your jobs or they're, they're, there's something wrong that tells you that you don't feel secure in your own country. And, and, and that's really the bottom of it. It's, the refugees speak two, three, four languages. They've come through hardship. They lost everything. They are going to be very entrepreneurial about things sometimes. It's scary to see how they to just go. They have big smiles and they have this strength compared to us sometimes. So it's, it's intimidating. And as uh, one refugee told me it was a year ago, he was like, Josephine, don't be angry at the xenophobes, the racist. I mean, I was a racist in my own country. I didn't want to travel. I didn't like the refugees and all of this. But then one day I had to flee. Um, and I had to just meet those strangers and those people. And I was one of them now. And it's human nature to be afraid to what we don't know, to the stranger. But it's another thing to be a populist and to take advantage of the fear of other people to put your own political agenda and interest first. And so he was sure, Josephine, don't be angry at the people that are afraid. Be angry at the one that manipulate the fear of others for their own interests, not for the interest of the people that are afraid. So I hope I answered your question. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Do we have one last question? Yeah, let's take one more. Um, we have one here. Are tech companies willing to acknowledge that the actions of the US business class are a primary cause of the refugee crisis in the first place? In the sense that, you know, <laughs> you know, through capitalism, you know, essentially that maybe some of the forces that motivate, you know, you know, the idea to seek a profit are actually contributing to the refugee crisis in the first place. So sort of how do you reconcile those two forces? So there's no refugee crisis, Anonymous. And... Uh, <laughs> or the hospitality crisis. Um, there's a hospitality crisis. Um, and uh, I don't think it's just tech companies uh, that are primary cause of the refugee situation, I'd point out first to oil and gas and, and, you know, like anything that is climate change, but tech companies are involved in this, you know, it's causing climate change. But we all responsible of it. It's the thing is like, they are responsible. They are responsible. We all responsible for it. And we need not to say, blame it on others and say, this is their problem. They need to fix it. 
this question is not saying this, but we want to all be part of the solution. <laughs> we need to stop talking about the problem. We need to be part of the solution. So the tech companies acknowledging, well, great if they acknowledge, but yeah, it will start by acknowledging that they can do a bit of the solution, and they do. And we have some tech companies that have followed us from the day, first day. It's Shipstead, uh, one of the major marketplace in Europe that has been day one with tech refugees. And Expedia has joined us last year, creating, uh, providing pro bono engineers to build technology with the innovators we have. So we have a few tech companies that are moving and, and going on to talk about this. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that more will come. It, it's needed, it's a fact. We'll have to come on board and every industry will have to come on board of that. Sadly, or we'll come together. It's great, no? <laughs> thank well, Josephine Goubet, thank you so much. Thank you.